Hello beautiful friends and bookish fam. My name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. Today we are here to talk about all of the books that I've read so far in the month of July. Yes, I am bringing back the mid-month wrap-ups. Y'all, if you've been with my channel for any length of time, you will know the struggle that I have faced trying to come up with the ideal wrap-up format. I have tried just about every single type of wrap-up that I can possibly think of, and I keep coming back to the mid-month wrap-ups. I know that's not everybody's preferred format. In fact, I think that's probably one of y'all's least favorite formats, and I truly, truly apologize. After spending the last couple of months just doing typical end-of-month wrap-ups where I wrap up everything that I've read for the entire month, I just realized that's not going to work out for me. Just based on how much I read and how verbose I can be with with these wrap-ups when I'm trying to articulately and thoroughly review the books. It just doesn't work out because it takes me, I kid you not, about an hour and a half to two hours just to film that video and it takes way, way, way longer to edit those videos. I just don't feel like I'm as good as doing book reviews when I'm trying to wrap up every single book that I've read for the entirety of the month. So in order to be the most efficient and effective at reviewing the books that I've read each month, I'm going to go ahead and switch back to mid-month wrap-ups and I hope that's okay with you. I have already seven or eight books to talk to you about today and one of them, the first one that I'm going to talk to you about. I'm not going to lie. It's going to be very, very lengthy. So buckle up. Let's go ahead and jump in. As I just mentioned, the very first review that I'm going to do, it's going to be lengthy and it's going to be spoiler filled. And the reason for that is because this was one of my most anticipated releases of the year and it ended up being quite a big disappointment. And in order for me to process my feelings on this story and in order for me to accurately kind of tell you why I feel this book was a disappointment, I don't feel like I can do that without giving spoilers. So the book that I'm talking to you about is The Last Word by Taylor Adams. And if you still have plans on reading this book and you don't want to risk any spoilers at all, please go ahead and jump to the timestamp that I'm going to put here on the screen so that you can avoid any type of spoilers whatsoever for this book. I've said this multiple times before, but y'all know how I feel about No Exit by Taylor Adams. It's one of my favorite suspense thrillers of all time, and so my hopes going into this were high. I went into this one with the highest of expectations, and unfortunately, it let me down immensely. I am still not entirely sure how I feel about this book, and so I'm going to try to process those feelings here with you today. So this follows our main character, Emma Carpenter. She's currently living in isolation on the coast in Washington. She is house-sitting out there. It is just her and her dog and that is exactly how she wants it. She's kind of reeling from a recent tragedy that occurred in her past. She's kind of fled away from it and everybody that she knew and she doesn't want to talk to anybody and the only person that she has contact with at all is her neighbor Dee who lives about a quarter of a mile away and the only way that they communicate is via whiteboard messages. They pass back and forth because they can see each other through their telescopes and really that is the only communication that she has aside with the homeowner and she's only communicated with her through text message. She essentially spends her days reading on her Kindle and one day she reads this particularly awful horror novel and she goes onto Amazon and she leaves a one-star review and to her surprise the horror author contacts her and asks her to remove that review. Now obviously she's not going to do that. She doesn't think that it's right that she's being asked to remove this review and so she says to the author that she's not going to do it and it actually leads to quite an unbelievable back and forth with her and this author. This author is not backing down and he kind of threatens Emma and then soon Emma starts to notice some pretty sinister things starting to happen around her. Like she thinks that she has seen somebody in her her house. The homeowner has contacted Emma and said that she caught a picture of a creepy man like in a mask on the doorbell camera and Emma starts to believe that it is basically the horror author who has come to basically take revenge for the one star review and this becomes especially true for her when she finds out that he has written like 16 other very similarly awful horror novels and she starts to believe that the things in those horror novels are not actually fiction that they are based on reality. So even though she thinks that it's absolutely absurd that this author would want to come after her for a one star review that's the only person she could think that would really want to hurt her but like how does he know where she lives and all of that stuff. So Emma soon realizes that she's going to kind of be in a fight for her life out there in isolation and it goes from there. All right, so here it goes. First, I really want to say that I recognize the level of satire that Taylor Adams put in this story and I actually found that quite clever and amusing. Taylor Adams acknowledges in here some of the overused stereotypical tropes that go along with horror and thriller and then he proceeds to put Emma through some of those stereotypical tropes. And so I feel like in some ways he is making fun of himself and other authors and the genre in general. So there is definitely Definitely a level of satire in here and I feel like the whole situation can be kind of seen as satirical in some ways. I get that and I can kind of see what Taylor Adams was trying to do. That's not what I wanted from this story and unfortunately the directions that Taylor Adams took in this book did not work for me. If I were to just sum up this book really succinctly I would say this is Taylor Adams including absolutely everything in here that you don't think could possibly be included because it's too obvious but then he puts it in there because he doesn't think the reader could possibly expect something so obvious to go into the story. I feel like literally everything that 
that happened in here was told on the dust jacket of the story and if you don't want any spoilers whatsoever don't read the dust jacket of the story because you're basically going to be able to predict the entirety of this story and I just wanted so much more from that and it was just so weird in a lot of instances so for example when you first read the synopsis of the story you have to believe that there's something more to this right it could not possibly be this author going after Emma because that's just not done right no matter how upset this author is over this one star review there really is no way he could possibly know where Emma is he could never go after her or things like that so you think that there's going to be something more in here and there is but at the same time there isn't because yes it is in fact HG Kane the horror author that is going after Emma he is the main villain in this story which I found disappointing and ridiculous and what was even more disappointing and ridiculous was that Taylor Adams did not even make him into a believable sinister sociopathic genius that you might expect from a story like this no HG Kane is just a troubled mentally ill disturbed virginal man that is basically obsessed with katanas and who has spent his whole life writing horribly written self-published horror novels so he's not even in my opinion a formidable villain he is more somebody that you would pity rather than be afraid of although you would definitely want to be afraid of him just because he is a disturbed person and you never know what he is going to do or what he is capable of but you get the idea he's not the sinister villain that you have put in your mind for the story that you are about to read and in fact this person has never really directly killed anybody before and so it kind of makes you wonder why is he all of a sudden going after Emma well there is definitely somebody pulling his strings and guess who is that person pulling his strings yes you guessed it the one and only other person that Emma has contact with while she is out there living in isolation D and so here is another example of well this couldn't possibly be true because Taylor Adams would never do this because it is so entirely obvious why on earth would the one and only person that Emma has contact with out there living in isolation be the one person that wants to hurt her oh my gosh that is just too crazy predictable but guess what it is Deke and I don't know if you all remember but when I was talking about this I think it was probably in like my most anticipated releases for 2023 I read the synopsis and I stopped because it says in the synopsis her only human contact is with her enigmatic elderly neighbor Deke and via text with the house's owner Jules I stopped and I said oh boy I hope I didn't just predict this novel right here because if she's only having contact with Deke and via text the homeowner Jules you have to know that one or both of these people is involved in the story some way right and guess what both of them are because Jules is not only the homeowner but she's also the mother of H.G. Kane like I said, if you don't want any spoilers for this book, you shouldn't even read the dust jacket because it's laid out there right in front of you. You have to know that Deke and Jules are involved in some way and they absolutely are. Now, I'm not really going to go ahead and get into why Deke actually wanted H.G. Kane to hurt Emma and all that stuff. I'll leave a little bit of mystery to you. But you can imagine my utter disappointment when basically everything that is on the dust jacket actually happens in this book. And it is just so weird and unfathomable to me. And I had a really hard time suspending my disbelief in this story because I just could not picture this actually happening. And I was so entirely frustrated and disappointed disappointed by the type of person that he made H.G. Kane out to be. Not even this formidable villain, but this person that you would pity rather than fear. So I just feel like the artistic choices that Taylor Adams made in this story are so insane and I'm really disappointed with the execution of it. Now I will of course say that overall I thought that this was really well written and for the first few chapters of the story I was in it. I was invested. I also loved Emma's relationship with her dog Laika who she called Space Dog and Emma really did everything that she could possibly do to protect her dog. Like it was okay if H.G. Kane went after her but don't you dare touch her dog and I really appreciated that of course I could relate to it so there were some parts of this that I really enjoyed and I really found entertaining and I really did enjoy the vibes in here because one of the things that I really enjoy about Taylor Adams writing is that he puts you immediately into an intense situation like you know for sure that something is going on and you know in his previous novels it's pretty much revealed fairly quickly who the bad guy is and who we're trying to escape from so he did the same thing in here and so you know that you're in the middle of an intense situation and so the intensity in this was there it was real but also I feel like that intensity was lessened because of the type of villain that he made H.G. Kane. So obviously I'm very frustrated by this story. I still don't entirely know how I feel because in some ways it was definitely different. It wasn't what I was expecting whatsoever and so I guess in those ways I should applaud Taylor Adams but also I still feel like this was weak overall and I couldn't agree with a lot of the artistic choices that he made and like I said I had a really hard time suspending my disbelief. I think I'm going to go ahead and settle on like a 3.5 because this is certainly something that I'm going to remember. It's not a meh book that I'm going to forget. Certainly not but it's also not what I wanted from this story at all and I feel like this could have been so much more intense, so much more thrilling, so much more high stakes and it just wasn't and it didn't give me the vibes that I was looking for overall. It is what it is. That's my spoilery ranty review for The Last Word by Taylor Adams. You're gonna have to comment down below and let me know what you thought of the story because it just didn't work for me y'all. I really wanted it to be so much more than it was and it just wasn't. Immediately after finishing The Last Word I picked up The Collected Regrets of Clover by Mickey Brammer. I picked this up because it was a recent book of the month selection. I'm trying to read these as they come in and so this came in from my library so I went ahead and jumped on the opportunity to read this. This also satisfied a TBR prompt of reading a book 
book with a name in the title. So this follows our main character, Clover, obviously, and from a young age, she has been very fascinated with death after her like kindergarten teacher keeled over and died of a heart attack. And she was so fascinated by death that she actually went on to study it in college. She traveled all around the world learning about death rituals and things like that. So naturally that makes her kind of peculiar to a lot of people. And when her beloved grandfather, who basically raised her, dies alone while he is in his office at Columbia and she's around the world traveling, she decides that she cannot stand the idea of anybody else dying alone. And so she makes her life dedicated to being a death doula. And so it is her entire job to basically be there as people die. Again, people who pretty much don't have anybody else. And she is there to kind of usher them into death. She feels that it is her job to bring peace and dignity to the dying process. And she considers it an honor to kind of be there to hear their last words, to hear their last pieces of advice, any regrets or confessions that they have. And she actually keeps track of all of these in these little notebooks. And it's kind of her way of remembering them and making sure that these people are not forgotten. So she takes this job very, very seriously. And she considers it an honor to be there as they take their last breaths. And while Clover has dedicated her life to making sure that nobody is alone when they die, she herself lives a very lonely existence. In the start of the story, she is 36 years old. She really has no friends. She's never been in a relationship of any kind. She lives in the same apartment that she grew up in with her grandfather. And her grandfather, even though he has been gone for 13 years, she's still surrounded by his things. She still is deep in her grief about his loss. And she really doesn't anymore get out of her comfort zone. She doesn't go travel. And like I said, she doesn't have any friends except for this octogenarian who lives in the building and who she knew while growing up. But one thing that she does do in her spare time is she actually attends these death cafes. And one day she's going to a death cafe and she meets this guy named Sebastian. And when Sebastian finds out what Clover does, he asks Clover to be the death doula to his grandmother who is dying of cancer. And so even though it's a little bit unusual and Clover doesn't typically do this type of thing, especially for somebody who already has a lot of people surrounding them, she does go to meet Sebastian's grandmother and they strike up a really beautiful friendship. She finds herself captivated by Claudia, who is Sebastian's grandmother and the life that she lived. And she actually finds herself desperate to bring resolution to Claudia who left something unfinished like 50 plus years ago. And so Clover kind of takes it upon herself to bring closure to this woman who ends up meaning a lot to her. And in the process of this, of course, Clover is going to find what she needs in order to start living her own life to the fullest and not living her life for everybody else. And to kind of go after what she wants so that her life is not full of all of the same regrets that she hears from dying people. You're following Clover who has basically spent her life dedicated to the deaths of others. So even though she is very stinted in her personal life, in her professional life, she is that empathetic, compassionate person that these people need while they are dying. But of course she herself is full of regrets because at 36 she hasn't had many of the same experiences that people her age and younger have had up until that point. She definitely knows that she's missing out on something but she doesn't really know how to go out and get it. And so this story is really about her finding who she is and what she wants in her life. You see her as she's making friendships and she's actually finding love of her own and she's doing all of these crazy amazing things. And I just really fell in love with Clover as a character overall. I was cheering for her as she was suddenly discovering love and friendship but I was also mourning with her as she was losing people that she deeply cared about. So I found myself deeply invested in her character in her life and I so rooted for her to find that happy ending that she was so desperately looking for. And of course this is a story that can't help but make you think about death and the way that you're living your own life and if you were to die today what would your regrets be and what can you do today to make sure that you don't actually die with those regrets. I really think that there's a lot that you can get out of the story even if you are not entirely into character driven stories. I feel like this book has a lot that can be offered. Clover kind of makes us realize that death is not a shameful topic that should be avoided. It is something that happens to each and every one of us. It's something that we all have in common. You know, we are all going to die someday. We have all experienced the death of a loved one and somebody close to us. And it doesn't change anything by not speaking about it. And I think that's a really strong message that is throughout the story. So like I said, I just really fell in love with Clover and her world and the people that she comes to meet. I really enjoyed following on her journey and I rooted for her so hard and I loved a lot of the messages that were in the story. So this was a really surprising read. I expected to enjoy it, but not maybe as much as I did. And so this was a solid four stars for me. After finishing The Collected Regrets of Clover, I jumped into Phantom Prince, My Life with Ted Bundy. So this is a true crime. It satisfied a true crime prompt from my TBR game. And this is the personal memoir story of Elizabeth Kendall, who was Ted Bundy's lover for many, many years. Ted Bundy met Elizabeth Kendall in 1969. That is right around the time when he actually started killing women. And this is a story of Elizabeth's personal accounting of her life at that time and what it was like with Ted Bundy and what happened when she started to realize that the Ted that the police were looking for was possibly her Ted and the fear and the terror that struck her. But at the same time, the fact that her brain could not let her believe that this monster was Ted, not the kind, loving, caring, compassionate man that she knew, the one that got along so well with her little daughter. She just couldn't wrap her head around it. And so while even though she was kind of working with the police and calling the police all the time with her suspicions, she was still deeply in love with Ted. And I will say that the relationship was definitely toxic at a lot of points because Elizabeth Kendall was certainly a needy person. She was a jealous person. Ted was not a faithful man. He always cheated on Elizabeth. So there was a lot of bad things about their relationship. But this book really makes you see 
see Ted through the eyes of somebody else who was a victim but it was a victim in a different way because obviously Elizabeth and her daughter are very lucky they made it out of their experience with Ted Bundy with their lives and so many people did not but she was a victim she had no idea who Ted Bundy was and what he was capable of she knew a completely different side of him and that came out really really well in here now is this the best written true crime no absolutely Elizabeth Kendall is not a writer so I would say at the core the writing in the story is very basic but she still does a fantastic job of painting a picture of her life and what she was like at the time and what her life was with Ted Bundy I will also say that I really appreciated the simplicity of the way that the story was told a lot of nonfiction and true crime tries to be really creative and clever with the way that they tell their stories so you'll be in the present with the person who is writing the story and doing all the research and stuff and then they'll jump back into past with like all the history and the contextual information and sometimes it's really hard to keep it all straight but this was a very linearly told story from the start of her relationship with Ted Bundy all the way to the very end of it this was originally written in the early 80s so at the time she originally wrote this story Ted Bundy was still alive and of course he has been executed for many many years now he was executed in 1989 so it's been like 34 years since he was killed and there has been several updated versions of this she's got some personal notes in here and you can just tell that when she wrote the story in 1981 when not everything was cemented and secured you could still tell that she had very strong feelings for Bundy that were back and forth on the positive and the negative like she still very much cared for him and loved him and could not still believe that all of this was happening I still felt like this was a very fascinating portrait of what it was like for her and like I said you get to see Ted Bundy in a whole different light you know we all know the stories of him like he was this super charming handsome man who was able to convince a lot of people of a lot of things and Elizabeth Kendall knew him on a very intimate nature I really do believe that in Ted Bundy's own way that he deeply loved and cared for Elizabeth even though he didn't always show it he didn't always treat her right I really do believe that in whatever way he could love a person he did love Elizabeth Kendall and so it was really really fascinating to see all of that through Elizabeth's eyes this was extremely short it's only like 200 and something pages it's a six hour audiobook and so if you listen to it on two times speed like I did you will get through this book in a day easy you can just sit down and probably bust through it there are certainly pictures in here so that is one benefit of um, like actually reading the story physically is that you get to see all of the pictures but I just really enjoyed this overall as much as you can enjoy a story like this I really am glad that I read it and I got to see her perspective and this was another four star read for me immediately after finishing that I read The 100 Years of Lenny and Margot by Marianne Cronin so this follows our main character Lenny she is 17 years old and she is currently in the terminal ward of a hospital I believe she has some type of cancer if I'm remembering correctly and she is never going to get better she is definitely in hospice and she is going to pass away she kind of spends her days in the hospital giving the nurses a hard time and harassing the hospital chaplain asking very pointed questions about God and the Bible and all of these things and actually to be honest with you her relationship with the chaplain in the story is probably one of my favorite things about this story I just loved it so much but she's definitely a cheeky spunky 17 year old girl who is very much aware of her situation but she's trying to make the best of it but also at the same time she can't help but question why why me why am I in the situation I'm only 17 years old I haven't really gotten to live my life yet and then at one point in the story the hospital opens an art room where the patients can go in and draw and paint and do all of these things and at that point she meets Margot who is an 83 year old heart patient at the hospital and she and Margot strike up this very very beautiful friendship and Lenny has the idea of kind of documenting their collected 100 years through paintings and drawings and things like that so one painting or drawing for every single year of their lives so the present perspective is told almost entirely from Lenny's point of view you're also getting little brief snippets of the past as she is painting her own story so you're getting little snippets of Lenny's life but of course Lenny is only 17 and she has hardly had an opportunity to live her life so she hasn't had very many experiences in her short 17 years so the vast majority of the past perspectives and the stories in here were Margot's as she's talking about her past 83 years and overall I just thought that this was a beautiful touching heartwarming story now I think my only complaint about this really is that you don't get a lot of Margot and Lenny's friendship in the present day you're following Lenny on her own and her own experiences in the present but when she and Margot together it's pretty much Margot telling Lenny all of the stories of her past and even though I really did come to enjoy a lot of the stories that Margot was telling I really do feel like it could have been condensed in some ways I really felt like she spent a lot of time specifically within a few years of her life and there were a lot of gaps in between there so I really feel like that could have been paced just a little bit better and I would also like to have seen the development of their relationship in the present a little bit more because I don't really feel like we got that we can ultimately understand that they had a really close friendship and how all of these stories kind of brought them together but I really would have liked to see more of the development in the present perspective but ultimately like I said this was extremely heartwarming extremely touching it certainly does steal a lot around death especially as Lenny is coming to terms with her own mortality she is a terminal cancer patient she is not meant to leave the hospital she only has a very short time left in her life and she spends that short time getting to know Margot and all of her stories and she finds a lot of joy and a lot of peace 
piece in Margot's story. There were definitely several things in here I thought could have been added or removed in order to make it somewhat of a stronger story, but ultimately I still thought this was a beautiful depiction of friendship, of life, of loss, of grieving. I just thought this was really touching. It was heartbreaking, but it was also heartwarming and tender at the same time. And this is certainly one that I recommend if you have not already picked it up. Really quickly, I did want to touch upon a DNF that I had in July, The Atlas Paradox by Olive Blake. I read The Atlas Six and I was not thrilled with it. I was not impressed with it at all. It was supposed to be somewhat dark academia, but I found the content of the story and all of the characters to be extremely, extremely pretentious and not in a good way and not in an accessible way. And I thought that maybe because I listened to it via audio, I could get more out of the sequel if I actually read it with my eyeballs. I was 100 pages in, absolutely nothing had happened by that point. I had no idea what the point and purpose of the story was going to be, the direction that it was going to head, because like I said, I was 100 pages in and absolutely nothing had happened by that point. We were just, you know, getting some of the individual perspectives of the characters as they were going through like kind of a final ritual type thing to be inducted into the Alexandrian society and I just didn't care. I don't like most of the characters in here. I definitely didn't like the narrators for some of the characters that were in the audiobook. My brain did not want a book to be so much hard work for very little payoff and so I ultimately decided to DNF the Atlas Paradox. I am willing to read a little bit more from Olive Blake. She has a couple of stories coming out like The Master of Death and One for My Enemy that actually sound really really good and I want to see what she can do outside of these stories. I want to see if all of her books are similarly written like very highbrow, very pretentious, very over the top in terms of the language and stuff like that. So I'm going to give her another chance but the Atlas Six and the Atlas Paradox just did not work for me unfortunately. The next book that I finished in July, All the Dangerous Things by Stacey Willingham, I ended up picking this up because it is a book club pick for the Bookworm Bitches book club on Goodreads for August and so I wanted to go ahead and get it out of the way. This also satisfied a TBR prompt of reading a suspense thriller so it worked out perfectly. So this follows our main character Isabel Drake and one year prior to the start of the story her 18 month year old toddler Mason was taken in the middle of the night and since then Isabel has really been on a furious search to find her son much to her detriment because since that time she also really hasn't slept with the exception of like micro naps that she takes in the middle of the day when she can't keep her eyes open any longer she really doesn't sleep anymore so obviously that is definitely affecting her health and her mental well-being but she is not going to give up until she finds her son on top of all this her husband left her during the course of the investigation her husband just kind of wants her to let go and move on but Isabel will not do that and so now her husband has left her he's moved out he is seeing another woman and so Isabel really feels like she is on her own and alone in her search and in order to keep Mason's name in the news Isabel is going out there she's going to like true crime conventions and things like that telling her story over and over just trying to get more attention on her son's case a lot of people have really negative thoughts about Isabel they hate to see what she's doing they think she's kind of exploiting her situation and they also think that she might have something to do with her son's disappearance but still she knows that she's not responsible and so when she's not conducting her own personal investigation like I said she's out there she's going to true crime events and everything like that so when a podcaster approaches her and wants to do his next podcast on her story she tentatively agrees but she's a little bit wary because he is paying far too much attention to her and her past and she doesn't understand why and she's really hesitant to keep talking about it especially because she finds out that he has been lying to her and hiding some secrets so she's trying to figure out who this podcaster is why he has so much interest in her and at the same time like I said there are many including the public and some of the police that believe that she is responsible for Mason's disappearance and she starts to remember some things that make her question her own sanity her own remembrance of the night that he disappeared and she also starts to wonder whether she is actually as not guilty as she thinks herself to be so ultimately y'all I was pleasantly surprised by this story I thought that this was very very well crafted and it ended up being different than what I was expecting so I give a lot of kudos to Stacey Willingham for this story what I found perhaps most enjoyable about this story was how naturally and casually Stacey Willingham was able to introduce all of these threads that would take you on different directions in terms of who could have possibly been responsible for Mason's disappearance. So obviously in the present day you're following Isabel Drake as she is now as she's trying to find what happened to her son but you're also getting past perspectives of three different timelines. You're following Isabel when she is a child and there is a reason for this. You're following Isabel immediately after she meets the man who's going to become her husband and Mason's father. Again there's a reason for this and then you're following her immediately after Mason's disappearance and so in each of these perspectives little things are thrown in here and there little threads are kind of put in the back of your mind to keep track of because they are all important and they could all potentially lead to the reason why Mason was taken from his crib and I thought that Stacey Willingham was able to weave that through so naturally and perhaps the best one of course most of all was the one that makes Isabel Drake herself somewhat of an unreliable narrator at the very start of this she is steadfast she knows that she had nothing to do with her son's disappearance but as we're starting to get into the story she starts to remember little things here and there and she starts to be told some things here and there that really makes her question her own sanity and makes her question what actually happened that night and if she could have potentially been responsible for her child's disappearance and she has no 
no memory of it whatsoever. And then of course, obviously, all of these past perspectives were woven in very, very well. And you find out the relevance of all of these perspectives as we get through the story. And I just thought that it was so well done and so well crafted. I had no expectations going into the story. And I ended up enjoying this a lot more than I expected to. In fact, I think that's kind of the theme of a lot of the books that I read in July. So ultimately, like I said, I thought this was very well done, very clever. And for those who really are trepidatious about an unreliable narrator like I am, I would still say go into this and be open minded. Because yes, she is somewhat an unreliable narrator. But the reason why was so mundane, but also so clever and unique. And it's not really something that I feel like you see constantly in stories, or maybe you do, and I'm just not reading these stories. I don't know. But I just really liked the reason for it. And it felt so plausible. Like I didn't have to suspend my disbelief for this. And that's what I really, really appreciated about it overall as well. I really enjoyed how Stacey Willingham wove all the threads together and ultimately the conclusion of the story. So I gave this a four stars. Like I said, it was a very solid reading experience and I'm pleasantly surprised by it. Another one that truly snuck up on me and has become one of the most beautiful books that I have read so far in 2023, Wayward by Amelia Hart. So this novel is ultimately about three individual women and you get their three individual perspectives. But there is an underlying theme and message throughout the story that is ultimately about what women have to endure at the hands of men, what they have to do to survive it, and how when working together the bonds and the strength of women can really overcome anything and I really just thought it was so beautiful and powerful. So like I said this is a story of three women. The first is 1619 and you're following Alpha and in the beginning of the story she's actually on trial for witchcraft. The husband of her best friend was brutally trampled by his cattle and a lot of people think that Alpha had something to do with it, that she conducted a spell or something that caused the cattle to stampede and so now she is on trial for witchcraft. Alpha like her mother before her was a local healer and Alpha's mother always told her that their magic is not one of spells and incantations. It's a magic born of a connection to the natural world and of animals. They have a deep spiritual bond with nature itself and the animals that inhabit nature and they're able to use this bond to create like the tinctures and the tonics and stuff that they need to be the incredible healers that they are. But of course women like Alpha and her mother have always been seen as very dangerous and things like that and so it's no great leap to see that Alpha was tried for witchcraft. And then you're following Violet in 1942 and Violet was born into a life of wealth and privilege but even so she kind of feels like she's basically trapped within the walls of her family's estate. Her mother died when she was very young. She's being raised by a father who kind of believes that women should be seen and not heard and that women just have a duty to go off and be married and bear kids and so she's very very stifled and she longs for the education that her brother receives. Violet has always been fascinated by nature including insects and all she wants to do is study them and be with them and she wants to be an entomologist so she feels like she's very much straitjacketed by societal expectations. And of course because she has such a strict and stern father she also has a deep longing for her mother who as I mentioned died when she was very young but her mother was also said to have been uncanny and very peculiar and it said that she kind of went mad before she died and so everybody's kind of worried that Violet is going to turn out like her but nobody will answer Violet's questions about her mother anytime she asks everybody kind of skirts around the topic and all she really has of her mother is a locket with the letter W in it and at the very baseboard of her room she finds the word wayward scratched into it so Violet is desperate to learn about her mother but nobody will tell her and then when a really traumatic experience causes Violet to be removed from the estate and kind of disowned by her family she ends up going to stay at Wayward Cottage which was actually her mother's and there she starts to get answers about who her mother really was and her heritage and why she feels such a deep connection to nature and all of that good stuff. And then the third perspective is Kate in 2019 desperate to escape her abusive partner and protect her unborn child in the middle of the night Kate flees London and she heads for Wayward Cottage. This isn't really a place that she's familiar with she doesn't even remember really being there before but it was given to her by her great aunt who she barely remembers who recently passed away and she just needs to escape she just needs to go so she heads towards Wayward Cottage and once she gets there Kate starts to suspect that her great aunt had a secret and it is one that could tie to the witch trials of the 17th century and so of course as she's starting to make Wayward Cottage her home she starts to learn a lot more about Violet and her family history and what that could mean for her and her baby and her future and I will be honest I was not expecting to love this nearly as much as I did this was just an incredibly stunning story I don't know whether it was the dark whimsy, whether it was the atmospheric magical elements to it, or whether I just really enjoyed learning about the three women themselves and their individual stories. It just really all combined really well to make a truly memorable reading experience for me. Now I will say that if you are going into these stories expecting each individual perspective to combine in some big huge meaningful way like you might get in a suspense thriller, I think you're going to be disappointed. Yes, obviously all of these perspectives are connected. They are all members of the same family. They all have the deep spiritual bond with nature and connection to wildlife and there are things that happened in the past perspectives like starting with Alpha moving on into Violet and then moving on into Kate that influenced each other so naturally all of these perspectives are connected but they are connected in soft subtle ways not big huge
huge revelatory ways, if that makes any sense. All of the timelines remain very much separate, but it's the legacy of the timeline before that really influenced the time afterwards. I hope I'm explaining that well. And I said in my Goodreads review that this book was truly like a balm for my soul, and I can't really explain it any better than that. I absolutely adored each wayward woman. I loved each perspective individually. I was never mad when we had a perspective switch. I was equally invested in all of them and all of their stories. I was absolutely horrified by some of the things that they had to overcome as women at the hands of men, but how strong they were and what they did to endure and survive. I loved Alpha, Violet, and Kate, and I just wanted to see how their stories ended, and I was not disappointed. I ended up giving this one a 4.5 stars, and this is probably going to end up being one of the best books that I read in 2023, so highly recommend. And the final book that I'm going to talk to you about today, it's one that I actually just finished yesterday, The Adventures of Amina al Sarafi by Shannon Sharker Bordy. This is just the dust jacket because the book is still in my backpack because I was reading it at work. This was such a fun pirate adventure fantasy. This originally was not on my radar at all, but it was sent to me as part of the adult fairy loop book only box, and I was absolutely captivated by how stunning this edition was. So that really is what intrigued me was I was like, I could not pass up the opportunity to read such a beautiful book, and I'm really, really glad I did. So of course, this follows our main character, Amina al Sarafi, and she was a very notorious pirate in her time. She has since retired after finding out that she was going to give birth to a daughter. So for the past 10 years, she's just kind of kept her head down, living a solitary life with her mother and her daughter. There's still a price on her head from a lot of people who want revenge on some of the things that she did to them in the past, because like I said, she was a very notorious pirate. She killed some people, she did some things, but she's just trying to live a quiet life with her daughter now. Until one day, she is found by the mother of one of her former crewmates. And that crewmate kind of died a very violent and tragic death. And it's something that Amina has always felt very, very guilty over. But basically this woman approaches Amina and says that her granddaughter, who was of course the daughter of this crewmate, has been kidnapped. And she's been kidnapped by this ruthless Frank and this woman now needs Amina to go save her granddaughter. And even though Amina is retired and she really has no interest getting back into the life, there are several reasons why she ultimately takes on this responsibility, especially the fact that her family is basically being threatened if she doesn't help. And she feels a lot of guilt and responsibility to her crew member who passed away. And so she's going on this adventure to try to find this woman's granddaughter. And it kind of goes from there as she gets into all kinds of shenanigans. I loved the characters in this story. This was just a lot of fun. There was a lot of humor going on in this story. It felt very much Pirates of the Caribbean-esque in the vibes that I was getting. There's definitely also some magic and some weirder things going on in here, which is where all of the fantastical aspects go on in this as well. I also will say that the audiobook was fantastically narrated. There are two different narrators for the audiobook, and they did a fantastic job. I feel like the person who voiced Amina al Sarafi, I'm gonna try to find her name and post it here because I feel like she captured Amina al Sarafi's voice so so incredibly well. So ultimately, this was a good fun time. I believe this is first in a series because this definitely leaves off in a way that is concluded. Like you feel satisfied with the conclusion of this. There's no like cliffhanger, but there's definitely more that you know Amina al Sarafi is going to do. And based on what happened in here, there's probably going to be enough for like three or four more books. Will I continue in this series? I don't know. I did have a really, really fantastic time, but it's not something that's like pulling me to read anymore. But I very much had a fantastic and enjoyable reading experience with this one. And I highly recommend especially if you were looking for just a fun, fast-paced fantasy read, this is the one for you. All right, everybody, that is it. Those are all the books that I've read so far in the month of July. And just to give you a bit of context, I've already been filming for an hour and eight minutes just talking about eight books. And so now I'm going to have to try to clip this down to a reasonable length. So you can imagine what would happen if I had another eight books that I had to talk to you about today. So this is why we're switching to the mid-month wrap-up. And like I said, I hope that's okay with you. Please comment down below and let me know if you have read any of the books that I've talked about today and what your thoughts are, especially for the last word. I'm really interested to know what y'all's thoughts are in the last word if you've read it. Or if you made it to the end of this video and you're not feeling very chatty, go ahead and either leave me a pirate flag emoji for Amina al Sarafi, or if there's like a blackbird crow raven emoji, go ahead and leave me that in honor of Wayward, which has definitely been my favorite book of the month so far. I absolutely love that one. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. If you would like to connect with me on any other platform, my Instagram, Goodreads, and IG threads are listed down below. And I would love to connect with you and chat with you on any of those other platforms. And in terms of booktube, I aim to post one video video a week, sometimes two, depending on what I can do. And I would sure love to see you in some of those next videos. Bye guys.